Hello folks, my name is Luke Street and I'm one of the photographic guides here at WildEye and uh, this is another episode of Behind the Frame. This is a series where one of the guides from WildEye, one of the photographic guides from WildEye, uh, goes over a photograph that we captured in the bush or on safari. Might be Svalbard, not always the bush, <laughs> but most of the time from Africa. And uh, we show you the photograph, we explain our settings, um, we tell you about the scene and we also go through some edits with you. So. Hopefully you enjoy it. Please feel free to post your comments below. And of course, if you have any photographs that you've seen on any of our feeds that you would like us to go over in this format, then just shout. Righto, folks, so here we go. I've got this camera looking at me in front. I've got this camera looking at me from the side and I've got my computer screen right over there for all of us to look at. So, Firstly, I'm going to explain the photograph. You just had a brief glimpse of it, um, but it's of course a lion running up a rock. It was very, very cool. Um, we got this photograph, or I got this photograph, in the eastern sector of the Serengeti in Tanzania. Um, it's a famed place for these rocky outcrops, these kopis all over the place, and it's quite famous for having cats on those kopis. Now, you can get a similar type of thing happening in the northern Serengeti, um, which is also an incredible place. I mean, the Serengeti is just amazing, no matter where you are, really. But the north and the east are, are very well known for having these kopis, these rocky outcrops, and um, having cats on them. So it's really quite fun. You head out as early as you can in the morning, try to get to the rocks, uh, which are everywhere, and uh, look for cats. <laughs> That's basically what you do. Uh, of course, during the migration, there are, uh, there's a much higher density of predators. Well, not higher density, because the lions don't really move. They're quite territorial. Um, but they do come out and play when there's wildebeest around, um, as everything else does, you know, cheetahs, leopards, uh, all sorts of things, even the hyenas. Um, but yeah, it was just a phenomenal scene. It was early one morning, we left the camp, we got to a section or a, a selection of corpies known as gull corpies. Go and Google that, it's an incredible place. Lots of these different little rocky outcrops all around the area. Um, and as we got there, two young male lions started heading up towards one of the rocks that we were kind of parked in front of. Um, so it was awesome. We got to photograph them coming through the grass right towards us. Um, they were calling against the wind. I mean, it's very windy out there on the plains. You have to remember that. It's not, a, uh, it's not smooth sailing as far as holding a big lens is concerned. Um, it is windy. So they were roaring against the wind. Could just hear it faintly, even though they were like 20, 30 meters away from us. And then slowly but surely, they headed up to this rock um, and started looking around. We didn't know at, the, at po that point in time that the reason they were coming to that rock was because there was another lioness secretly sleeping up there that we hadn't seen yet. So anyway, she was uh, revealed to us later on in the sighting when they eventually found her and she sat up, got a bit grumpy because they had found her as lioness so often do when males find them. Uh, but yeah, it was just a, a really, really cool scene. Um, obviously, when you're trying to capture uh, a photograph of this nature, um, you know, we went for the silhouette, uh, of course, beautiful blue sky. I mean, this is, I don't know what time it was, but the sun was very much up at this point in time. And if you have a look, you can see my settings here. ISO 200, which is really, really low. I was shooting this on the 300 millimeter, um, and I had the capability here of going at f6.3. Um, you know, there was so much light, I, I didn't have to shoot this at 2.8 or anything lower than 6.3. So rather, rather make sure you get something really tack. Um, he wasn't far from us, I'd say probably about 30 meters at this point in time. This photograph's uncropped, so for those of you that do use a 300 millimeter lens, you will know basically how far away I was. Um, and then you can see my shutter speed was 1 over 8 thousandth um, of a second, which is pretty quick by camera standards. Of course today, mirrorless cameras go up to like 1 32 thousandth of a second, which is really quick. And there was another shot, I'll show you the shot that I took at this particular scene uh, later that I took it at 1 32 thousandths of a second. But 1 8 thousandths is more than enough to capture a lion, even basically at top speed. I mean, 1 8 thousandths will, will freeze most birds for you. So right up there in terms of speed. Um, but yeah, let's jump back into the, the photograph. So um, that's just basically my settings. Um, there is a selection of photographs that I took here. I mean, I was obviously hitting this scene at, uh, at pretty quick uh, frames per second. You can see here, um, I went from that, that was the first lion, because there were two of them that went up. So as he was going up, I could see, hold on, my settings are not right where I am. Uh, luckily, his younger brother, or, or his brother, cousin, whatever it might be, of a similar age, um, had a go at going up the rocks as well. So we managed to move the vehicle, get our settings right, 
and uh, this is the sort of selection of images. Now, I was very, you know, I, I didn't know which photograph to choose here. There's this one where his back is lovely and straight and it shows his strength and that tail flick is just awesome. Um, and then there's also uh, the, this, this one. Yeah, it was this one that I was keen on. Um, where was it now? Um, yeah, I think it was... The one that kind of showed his power and going up, I think it was this one. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was just a great, great scene and something really fun to photograph. It's not very often that you, this is the one, it's not very often that you get the, the possibility or the, the chance to photograph something um, this beautiful. So, you know, when life hands you lines running up a rock, photograph it at a fast shutter speed and underexposed so you can get that beautiful silhouette. Um, anyway, back to the photograph. Uh, so yeah, I mean, let's let's dive into this image. Let's see what we can do with it um, And let's have a bit of fun uh, So first and foremost, I've dropped this menu here We're gonna get as much screen real estate onto this line as possible um, And let's start going through some edits on him. So first and foremost we can see I mean obviously I'm shooting in raw and so you can see that the sky is pretty um, You know, it's pretty dull in terms of actually how blue that sky was. So we've got some work to do there. We've also got this corner over here, which is kind of breaking the black hard stencil outline. So we're gonna to have to do something about that. Um, but other than that, there's not very much that needs to happen here. This is shot with a Nikon Z9 um, on a 300 millimeter, as I said earlier, and you can see it's, it's beautifully tack sharp all the way through. So very chuffed with that. There's a little bit of noise coming out, which is to be expected when you're shooting up at a bright sky. Um, cameras, you know, they struggle with things like this, but I mean, really at face value, there is no noise folks. And please remember noise is not the devil. It's, it's fine to have a little bit of noise. Be careful not to let your camera have noise reduction settings on. Uh, that's a big one that I counter a lot of people having on their cameras. And essentially all you're doing there is you're allowing the camera, which is not a very intelligent in terms of AI or human intelligence. Um, it's not a very intelligent device in terms of making up its mind as to how much noise to reduce. And what you often end up with is quite a blurry, soft lined image. So watch out for that. I always turn noise reduction off in camera. That's not worth it for me. There's also programs like Topaz. I'm not a big user of Topaz. Um, but they are available. There's things out there that you can use to denoise. De There's even a new feature within Lightroom that uses AI to denoise. So Lightroom is basically adding everything that you need into one program. So just bear that in mind. Um, but yeah, let's jump back to the photograph and let's get started. All right, so first and foremost, what I do when I edit, I first just apply all my masks. So we're gonna apply it to the sky. Watch how cool this will pick up. So very nice. I mean, obviously we can see that line sticking out now, but we really are not, too concerned about that line um, sticking out in this regard because it is a silhouette. So we're gonna mask him as well. We're gonna make him probably even more black than he is at the moment. Um, so when you do encounter um, a mask, sorry, when you do encounter a mask that looks something like this, don't be too worried, especially with a silhouette shot that, okay, well now the line's looking kind of masked. So I'll show you quickly, we've masked the sky and really all we're gonna do with that sky is drop the temperature. So. Um, as soon as you start dragging, you'll see that the, um, the overlay goes away. So yeah, you can also push O for overlay and O for overlay off uh, if you want, if you're a hotkey kind of person. Um, so really all I'm doing is dropping the temperature here um, and we're gonna get it to something that does look, I mean, obviously it's gonna look a little bit fantastical, but it is a beautiful blue sky. Something like that looks perfectly fine and you can see it hasn't affected that line at all. So the line still looks fantastic. Now, what you can also think about doing on a sky mask like this is playing with highlights. They can often make things look quite a, a bit more realistic when shooting at a, at a bright sky like this. And of course, that looks a little bit more similar to blue, the blue of the blue sky, <laughs> other than that, which is quite dark. It also helps your line pop out beautifully. And so you can see I'm whacking it all the way up to 100% highlights. Um, and you can also even come down to whites and see what that's gonna do. So you see, now you end up with a sky that looks basically like the real sky. I'm not gonna do that though, because I do want it to be a little bit more moody and so forth. So maybe just a little bit of white like that. And really, I think that's all I need to do to the sky. Um, so we can go back to our masking now. We can create a new mask and let's select the subject. There we go, we've got our line pretty well. I'm not gonna be too concerned. Once again, folks, if you have followed some of my tutorials before, or if you've been guided by me and you know, and you've edited with me, you'll know that 
or I probably have shown you that masking is, is, it doesn't have to be this finite thing of following each little hair around the edge of this line and so forth and getting every last little bit of it covered up. It's, it's really not worth it. The, the time involved in doing it is not worth the effect that you get out of it. So yeah, for me, um, I just basically mask off like this. It looks perfectly fine to me. Um, and all I'm gonna do is basically sharpen him a bit. Um, and and maybe just underexpose him a little bit. We want to be careful. We don't have to under, underexpose too much. When we do that, you'll see that he kind of loses his his shape. All right, so it gets a little bit more blurry around the outside. Watch his mane. There you go. You see it kind of just loses a little bit. So what we could do is we could just come to blacks and we can push the down arrow on your keyboard and just get that nice finite coloring going or, or opac opacity going, um, depth. So I'm going to go down probably there. We don't want to go too far. You can see the main starting to lose detail again. So let's maybe leave it at about 20. I think that looks fantastic. All right. Now what we want to do is get this corner. All right. So we have two options uh, in order to get that corner. And probably the easiest option is just to create a new mask. Grab yourself a brush. You can see where we need to color in and what we need to do. Everything else is pretty silhouetted perfectly. And so what we're going to do is we're going to change this flow and the density up to 100, we just want to whack this thing in, uh, in one solid swoop. And remember, with your density and flow sliders, they're very, very important. Don't hit everything at 100%, 100, 100. Always manipulate that a little bit. You might find yourself sometimes needing a very soft brush because you don't want to affect things too heavily. And I'll sometimes set that down to 20, 20 or 20, 100, 40, 40. It just depends on the situation. But because we're trying to get a very deep, black here and a very deep mask. We're going to set it to 100, 100. We're going to whack it and we're going to do it quickly. All right, so watch this. So we're just going to start painting here. Um, and we're going to get that whole bit. Don't worry about that a little bit there. We'll see what effect that has. Um, obviously, you've got to be a little bit careful. But there we go. So we've got it. We cannot turn the overlay off just by pushing O. Of course, remember, you can leave the overlay on. And as soon as you start doing something, it will disappear, that overlay. And you see, all we have to do is bring the exposure down and we're done. All right, so we've got rid of that black corner or that, that little bit lit up corner. Um, now, that's kind of it, I think, for the masking, right? I mean, this is a photograph that was, you know, if I do say so myself, shot pretty well in camera. And a lot of the time you don't have to do too much to it to make it look really, really good. So yeah, let's jump back into it and have a look at what we can do maybe about the corners because you can see that there is a slight vignette coming across this photograph. So, uh, and that's to be expected shooting straight up at the sky. Okay, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna come down here to lens correction. That's usually where you'll be able to deal with the vignetting. And for those of you that do follow my photography, you'll know that I'm a big fan of vignettes. I will often add a vignette, a post crop vignette to my images because I love it. It brings your focus into where your subject is. It's a very powerful thing, not a lot, not a lot, don't make it look cheesy, but you can add a little bit to your photograph and it just brings your viewer's eyes straight into where your subject is. I'm a person that likes to shoot things center down the barrel. Um, you, you know, that's kind of how I like shooting things. Um, not often with the rule of thirds, rather straight down the middle. I like that sort of thing. So anyway, back to the photograph. Let's get rid of this vignette. And really all we're gonna do is we're gonna enable the profile correction like that. Um, and basically what that's done is it's just popped the photograph out a little bit. Now, it hasn't had that great of an effect on the vignette, um, which is a bit unfortunate. Often it, it does, um, but in this one, it's not gonna give us that. So what we need to do is maybe come down here. Now, this is one thing where you can add the post crop vignette, and we wanna actually maybe lighten up. The, see there, we can add it, we can make it more ridiculous, like that, like a 1920s photograph if you want. Um, or what we can do is lighten those edges, which, you know, makes it look like a bad school project. Um, so when you're confronted with a corner like this, maybe you can bring it up just by that plus five. Um, you don't have to bring it up by plus five entirely. You can just bring it up by maybe plus one, plus two, and that will just ever so slightly take away those dark corners. Maybe plus five, no, plus four. I'm happy with that. I mean, look, you are gonna end up with a little bit of a darker corner here, and that's fine. Um, so yeah, that's basically how I deal with the vignette here a little bit. Um, then I'd come down, I like to calibrate my photographs. Usually what I'll do is give plus five to each of these. Um, it just makes things a little bit richer and it also brings in a little bit of warmth. 
it's actually pretty cool. A lot of people don't use this color calibration tool within Lightroom, but I do for basically every single photograph. Now, it's not to be taken lightly, but the way you can think about it is your sensor is an RGB sensor. So it's shooting red, green, and blue, and from that it is deriving all the colors that you're seeing within your photograph. So essentially, when you're playing with this very bottom color calibration tool, you are affecting that RGB, and that will have an effect on all the colors within your frame, not just the reds, not just the greens, and not just the blues. So it's a great way to calibrate every single color with three sliders um, in your photograph. So yeah, let's jump back to it. Um, so we've given it plus five. I mean, look, we can, I can show you what this will do if we pump them all the way up. All right, so you can see, ooh, we're getting to mysterious land there. Um, so let's take it all back down. You can see where we were. We're not adding a lot. We're just giving the blue a little bit more punch. And what I often find is that doing this will also increase the warmth. And I might show, that, show you that briefly in another photograph that actually has a bit of warmth to it. Of course, in this, we don't want to throw too much warmth into it. Um, but yeah, basically that is it. I mean, for those of you that do like to sharpen, let's quickly sharpen. All right, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna come down to masking. You're gonna click with your mouse on this little slider. You're gonna then push option on uh, Mac or Alt, I think it is on Windows. And then you're gonna push those both at the same time and slide until you have a very well-defined line of where you would like the sharpening to take effect. You see, if you do it like this, it's gonna sharpen everything and you can see all that noise that it's gonna potentially sharpen. So you don't wanna do that. You don't wanna accentuate noise. You just wanna accentuate those lines. And when you have a nice bold line like this, look at that, that looks great. You're gonna then let go. You're gonna come up. We're gonna add an amount. I never go over 70. And for this, we're already dealing with something that's quite sharp. So I'm just gonna stop at 65. We wanna give it a little bit of radius. I usually go up to about 1.8, somewhere between 1.8 and 2.4. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, these are negligible changes that we're making, so yeah. And of course, we're not dealing with a detailed photograph here uh, in terms of fur and eyes and things like that. So, but even when I am dealing with a photograph like that, very seldomly do I add any detail to the sharpening mask, all right? So yeah, let's go back to the laptop. Um, so yeah, kind of happy with that. You can come here, I know a lot of people like to play with this. I also do, it's not a very colorful photograph though, so just watch out. We've, we've done what we need to do with the sky in terms of bringing down the, the temperature of it. Um, but if we want, we can come and say, well, maybe, maybe we do need to add a bit more blue to the sky. We'll take a little bit out. Okay, but maybe we want to make it black and white. Woo, but I'm going to keep it color because I'm a sucker for color. Um, so you can see, we can bring the saturation of that color a little bit up if you want. You can play with hue and luminance. It's, it's a goofy one to play with. Just play with saturation, really. Um, so yeah, maybe just a little bit more oomph on that. And um, yeah, I think that photograph is essentially done. Um, it's a quick one, you know, it's a, it's a silhouette shot. I love silhouette photography. It is one of my favorite ways to take photographs. Of course, you might look at this photograph, I might look at this photograph a few weeks down the line, a few months down the line when it comes to me wanting to either print it or, or whatever. And then I just wanna do one more quick brief over, sharpen up a few more things. But generally speaking, I think it looks great. It's a, it was a very, very cool scene. It kind of shows the power of the line about to jump. As I said, there, it was a toss up here between photographs and which one I was gonna go for. Um, that straight back and that tail is, ooh, that's nice. Um, but yeah, and then there was just some here where he's really exhibiting his power and jumping up that. I mean, it was a very steep rock face to go up. Um, so there we go, there, there's the photograph. Um, and then I said I would show you a photograph uh, just briefly that I shot at 1 32,000th of a second. One of my favorite photographs ever. Um, it's this one. And I did shoot this um, in color, color was, was what I was intending. Um, I just did that for black and white for a print. Um, but yeah, this photograph I did actually enter into the Natural History Museum um, competition. Unfortunately, it wasn't shortlisted. So Wah. but it's fine <laughs> you know i enjoyed the photograph i enjoyed taking the photograph it was a lot of fun um, and you can see here this was shot at 132 thousandths of a second iso 64 to get that battery smooth sky there is no noise out there um, and then shot at five six i mean aperture for me is the third most important thing the most important is shutter speed followed by iso then aperture aperture kind of gets me into the zone so i prefer focusing on capturing speed beautiful color which, and, and noise-free images, which is ISO low, in other words. Um, so yeah, anyway, I wanted to quickly show you before I go back to camera, how playing with these calibration tools can change the temperature of your image. You see that, you bring them all up. So instead of playing with your temperature slider, come down here, fiddle with calibration, guys. 
You will not regret it. It's good fun and it gets you a lot more finesse in terms of getting your temperature right. All right, so yeah. I am also one of those people that shoots um, natively in Kelvin on, in camera and I constantly change my Kelvin. So it's kind of like the fourth step. You get shutter speed, ISO, aperture, which we're all used to changing. I'm also a full manual shooter. But what I did is I also added in a fourth element to that, which is temperature. So I will actively be changing temperature in camera while I'm going through a shoot. But um, yeah, thank you so much for joining me, folks. I hope you enjoyed having that brief editing session. Please feel free to post your comments below. Please feel free to let us know which photograph you would like us to go a little bit more in depth on, and we will happily do that for you. By the time you see this, I will actually be in Tanzania. So I look forward to getting back and showing you all a bunch of new content and maybe have some fun editing another photograph. But until the next one, guys, keep well and see you all soon. Bye.